Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, America was brought to its knees. As the fading summer sun rose over New York City and its many millions of residents went about starting their day, 19 hijackers seized control of four passenger planes and systematically crashed them into each of the two most prominent World Trade Center towers, the Pentagon, and aimed a fourth for either the Capitol building or the White House before its heroic passengers forced a different outcome. Within moments, the iconic Manhattan skyline was engulfed in flames, smoke and screams, and the world watched on in horror as the towers collapsed in a devastating cascade of destruction. Though America was broken, a nation was united in mourning the many thousands of lives that were tragically taken in the attacks, with many, including those in higher power and persuasion, demanding immediate justice and revenge. Welcome to the penultimate episode of Series 9 at I Could Murder a Podcast. We are back once again with a huge case, a case that's been requested many a time during our time doing this podcast. And I'm joined by the ridiculously ravenous, the regrettably rusty, the really, really, really runny Ben Carter. It's really, really runny. You can add rashy as well. Well, that was actually going to come annoyingly. I wasn't going to bring it up. I just thought people will see it and yeah, respect, respect me for not saying it. <laughs> It's doubled down. Um, no, yeah, thank you so much for that glowing introduction, Tom. Uh, great to be back. Um, a big, big episode. Actually, hands up, it did win our audience vote as well, but we sort of disguised that and have moved on. But yeah, an absolutely huge case, one that we're all very, very intrigued by, uh, and uh, I'm thrilled to be joined by producer Dan. I'm very excited about today. Yeah, I don't know if I've, if my viewpoint is kind of is common or it's rare, but I kind of, obviously when it happened, I was shocked and stunned and it's a very sad moment. Um, but then I quickly fell into the conspiracy uh, side of things, um, watched a few documentaries. Um, I don't know if we'll go into that, but big one was Loose Change, I believe. Um, watched that many a time. But then I, I 180'd away from the conspiracy uh, back to what I think is reality. So um, we can dive into that later. Interesting. Yeah, I think I follow a similar kind of path. I'm still not sure if I'm 100% 180. But yes, it's, it's a very, it's one that, you know, like a lot of the ones we've done in the series, very polarizing. It, it creates a lot of argument and discussion. We're here to discuss rather than to argue. And we hope, obviously, we understand a lot of people have a lot of strong opinions about this. And we're merely putting our opinion out there. We're not belittling your opinion if you disagree with what we're saying. And yeah, we obviously respect everyone else's opinion as well. And of course, um, Ben didn't do the cryptic clue last week. I had a go at it. And it was... Next week's case is, is the episode or something like that. And basically, because it's a series nine, episode 11. Um, and it was a beautiful accident, really, wasn't it? Mm. Oh, wow. The case choice. Yes, completely unintentional. Um, it's just, yeah, that's just the way it's lined up. Whoa. The case. But yeah, completely unintentional. We are one episode away from our series finale. But yeah, I mean, this is a huge, huge case. Um, arguably the most significant event of the 21st century. And yeah, one that understandably there are entire podcasts on. 29 hour episodes on. We're going to try and condense where we can. Focus on the timeline of events before then. Getting sort of immersed in that world of conspiracy. I think I'm kind of different. I've never really, I've always been so shocked and upset by the events that i've never really wanted to consider the conspiracies but 
I do understand where they come from and I understand why some people are so passionately behind some of them. But yeah, some of them are just complete fucking bollocks. Um, <laughs> but that's just me. That's just me. Um, and yeah, excited to see where we go with this one. So this week is, of course, the September 11th attacks, also known as 9-11, America's deadliest terror attack, the day that changed the world forever, the 9-11 turning point and the war on terror. So yeah, as we as we mentioned, it's a it's a huge case that uh, we're going to condense. There are obviously there's so much aftermath, legacy, conspiracy surrounding it. The only case we've ever covered that maybe has a similar element to it. Well, there's a couple, isn't there? The the 2015 Paris attacks, which we also found difficult to condense, and then we also did the Boston Marathon bombings. Again, difficult to uh, condense condensed but our our aim is to paint a picture of the build-up to the attacks as well as then a detailed uh, timeline of events minute by minute of what happened that morning then we're going to look at the uh, kind of the conspiracies that were born out of 9-11 uh, and uh, yeah and, and look at the aftermath then but it's yeah it's a case that understandably holds a lot of emotion and yeah almost everyone in some way was affected by this or knew someone that was um, do you boys remember where you were when it happened or what you were doing I was going to a friend's house um, and then we walked into the door and it was on the telly. Um, couldn't really comprehend. I think I was only 12 at the time. Well, 11, 12 um, at the time. You were 11, mate. You were 11. I was 11. Yeah. Okay. Well, you said you were 15. I was, uh, you were 11, I was 12 and then Dan was like 13 and a half. No, we'll get onto that later. But um, in, with that, I remember walking in, seeing the TV, yeah, not really understanding exactly the significance, obviously, I think any of us did. It's, it's funny how it works, because I've got a rubbish memory at best, really. Um, but I remember exactly where I was when I heard the news of that um, similar sort of situation. So I'm going to a friend's house and finding out about the news. Yeah, crazy. Wow, I was uh, I was not going to a friend's house, but I would have loved to, would have loved to. Um, you, play, you were playing bowls, weren't you? Yeah, something like that. But I uh, I remember I, I'm sure timing wise, I'm the same as Dan, remembering exactly where I was. What I, I, I had just got home from school. It was on TV. The first plane had hit. My mum was in the kitchen, and then the second plane hit live. And I remember shouting in to her that a second plane had hit, and she thought I was. It's just a replay. It's just a replay, and it. it it wasn't a replay, but it was, yeah, I remember vividly sitting there watching it happen live, Sky News, and even the reporters, I don't feel, completely understood how to react when the second plane hit as well. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's a um, huge case. Isn't that one of the big conspiracies that BBC News reported, that the second tower collapsed, but it hadn't behind them? Ooh. Ooh dun, dun, dun. See, this is, a, oh, Dan, I want you to kind of just, just, be a cloud of conspiracy and just kind of a little bit of spots okay. of rain, a little bit yeah. of drizzle here and there. Where you go, oh, I think they said that. Oh, that'd be <laughs> yeah, great. I can do that. So as always, a quote to start us off. And this week's comes from former US Secretary of State, John Kerry. Remember the hours after September 11th, when we came together as one to answer the attack against our homeland. We drew strength when our firefighters ran upstairs and risked their lives so others might live. When rescuers rushed into smoke and fire at the Pentagon, when men and women of Flight 93 sacrificed themselves to save our nation's capital, when flags were hanging from our front porches all across America, and strangers became friends. It was the worst day we have ever seen, but it brought out the best in all of us. So what we're going to do is take a brief look into what was going on in the world in 2001, which, oh, 23 years ago. Oof. Crazy how time flies. I say flies. Yeah, crazy how time moves. So we're going to look briefly into the year of 2001, what was going on at the time, and then the build-up to the attacks. 2001 was a huge year for the world in many different aspects, including technology, economics, science, politics, and pop culture. The year started with the launch of Wikipedia and iTunes, with the first-generation iPod arriving later that year, as well as the Xbox, GameCube, and Game Boy Advance. The same month, the world's first animals from an endangered species were officially cloned, with an Indian bison named Noah being born in Iowa, whilst a mouflon lamb named Dolly was born in Italy. Drug Lord El Chapo escaped from prison for the first time. A significant oil spill occurs in the Galapagos Islands as HMS Jessica runs aground in the aptly named Wreck Bay and spills 660,000 litres of oil into the ocean. And yeah, as we mentioned earlier, meanwhile, I think Tom was 11, I was 12, and Dan was just over 12. 
In music, 2001 delivered a, a very diverse year. Um, Hybrid Theory came out by Linkin Park, which was kind of a CD that everyone seemed to own. Um, but people that owned it might also have owned uh, Hot Shot by Shaggy. No, no from Dan. It's a yes from me. I bought the, uh, I, I didn't really know about singles, so I bought a Now CD because it had, it wasn't me on it. Nice. Classic. Classic. I was too young to know kind of what was what. <laughs> the E-Boys, obviously, a bit. Yeah. Well. <laughs> Probably a vinyl, right? <laughs> But enough about music. Let's move on to film. In film and television, 2001 gave us both the first Harry Potter movie and the first Lord of the Rings movie, whilst also delivering the first Fast and Furious movie and other classics such as Shrek, Pearl Harbor, Monsters Inc., Zoolander, The Mummy Returns, Ocean's Eleven, and Freddy Got Fingered. Didn't see him or well, that film getting a mention yeah, so today. A lot going on in that year, weren't there? People forget. There was a lot. Yeah. There was a lot, yeah. There's another big thing we're going to talk about. We are going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> so that was kind of what was going on in the world. Uh, just a little bit of sort of lightness where we could find it. Now on to 9-11. Throughout the first eight months of the year, you could be forgiven for not knowing that tensions between America and some parts of the Middle East were simmering to an all-time high. Specifically from the perspectives of Al-Qaeda's founder and leader, Osama bin Laden and the Taliban, as well as a network of extremist cells within Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Iraq and Iran. From as early as 1996, bin Laden had issued his first fatwa, which essentially declared war against the United States and any American soldiers that were on Arabian soil. Shortly after this, it is believed that bin Laden was presented with the very first plans for hijacking attacks on America. Uh, and yet he was, he was presented these plans by Pakistani terrorist Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, um, who's basically a very infamous looking man, um, hairy guy wearing what looks to be the world's largest t-shirt. Um, that's how I remember him and, and I stand by that claim. Um, KSM, as it's abbreviated, suggested that the group hijacked several planes on both the east and west coasts of America before flying them into numerous targets in LA and New York. But Bin Laden gave initial feedback to simplify the attacks and focus on New York and Washington before telling him he was too busy dealing with other planning. Basically, he said his, his plans were occupied. He was in the process of uh, relocating Al-Qaeda from Sudan to Afghanistan. And he also was planning other attacks, which turned out to be the 1998 US embassy bombings, uh, one of which was in Nairobi, Kenya, and another in Tanzania. Um, and yeah, these, these bombings actually went on to claim the lives of 220 people. So although Bin Laden said no to, initially said no to his plans, he did say that they would remain in touch and that once he and his associates were more available, they would recommence contact with him uh, and they considered his plans to be impressive and ambitious. Bin Laden issued his second fatwa just two years later in 1998. He was additionally irritated by and did not like how the US had supported Israel and kept troops in Saudi Arabia after the Gulf War. So from this he asserted that true Muslims were obligated to aggressively fight back against America by any means necessary until uh, America was essentially forced to change its policies. Bin Laden had called for a global jihad against perceived enemies of Islam, placing the United States squarely in its crosshairs. And it soon became clear that more drastic measures would be required in order to get America to to listen, with Bin Laden stating that a defensive war must be waged against America and that military strikes must be launched against American infrastructure in order to, quote, send a message to American people. Um, so basically he was saying if we do something drastic, if we cause some severe damage or severe loss of life, American people would then in turn reevaluate their government's international stance and policies and basically use the people against them. In the midst of his second fatwa, Bin Laden said the following um, when he said, sat down to do an interview with an American journalist who was also a police official. We tell the Americans as people, and we tell the mothers of American soldiers in general, that if they value their lives and the lives of their children, to find a nationalistic government that will look after their interests and not the interests of the Jews. The continuation of tyranny will bring the fight to America as the 1993 World Trade Center bomber Ramzi Youssef and others did before. Bin Laden continually stirred the pot with regards to already simmering tensions between the United States and Middle Eastern countries, particularly those with strong ties to Islam, whilst also stating that America was doing the same towards him and his country and religion. Issues such as Israeli-Palestinian conflict, US support for authoritarian regimes in the region, and America's military presence in Saudi Arabia, fueled by a growing anti-American sentiment and provided increasingly fertile ground for recruitment by extremist groups like Al-Qaeda. This ultimately resulted in Bin Laden giving the green light to Khaled Sheikh Mohammed to continue with his plans to systematically strike and shock America. 
This is my message to the American people, to look for a serious government that looks out for their interests and does not attack others, their lands or their honour. My word to American journalists is not to ask why we did that, but to ask what their government has done that forced us to defend ourselves. You will see the results of our work in a very short time. Between the final months of 1998 and the majority of 1999, bin Laden and his deputy, Mohammed Atif, held a series of meetings with KSM where they helped to support and refine his plans for the attacks, providing operational advice, financial support, strategic overview, the recruitment of willing participants, visas, as well as their flying lessons and arranging for travel to America. In total, according to a 9-11 commission report, the group spent between 400,000 and 500,000 to plan and conduct the attacks, spending up to three years planning everything. So recruitment, as you probably would have thought, wasn't straightforward when it comes to picking um, who would be flying the planes. Uh, Bin Laden and co were extremely picky when it came to who they would and would not bring on board for the operation. Uh, they had to keep their ultimate plans as a secret the entire time, kind of like Mask Singer, uh, whilst also selecting people that they were sure could carry out their orders efficiently to the very word. They rejected people based on their ability to speak English, poor performance during flying lessons, lack of experience living in Western countries, poor education, or for simply not believing that they were capable jihadists. Like in some job interviews, they would sort of turn you away if you didn't turn up in a suit. Dan, you're going to be our resident conspiracy theorist in this, because I think you're a bit more clued up with some of the conspiracies. Wasn't one of the ones the fact that it was extremely hard to fly the plane in order to make, make the impact as they did? It, it would have to be like a a very well-trained person to be able to pull that off or yeah that's that's one of them those planes are incredibly difficult to fly there are thousands of buttons in the cockpit um mm. and it's just it's just not a simple thing it's not microsoft flight simulator um, no so no. yeah so from bin laden's point of view obviously there's so many things that can go wrong and this process you know they put so much time and effort into this and they see it as such a obviously important thing from their perspective picking the right person for the job and the task um was something they took very seriously um, eventually, 19 hijackers were selected and placed into primary and secondary teams. The primary group was selected as pilots and co-pilots, whilst the secondary was selected as, quote, muscle. In the recruitment process, they discovered that one member, Hani Hajur, already had a commercial pilot's license, so he was able to provide additional training and advice to others. Of the 19 selected, 15 were originally from Saudi Arabia, two were from the United Arab Emirates, one was from Lebanon, and one was from Egypt. The men began arriving in different parts of America, some using fraudulent passports, as early as January of 2000, while the last arrived in predominantly the secondary hijackers in May and June of 2001. The men all began speaking English and wearing Western clothing, whilst at least six of the men received flying lessons and or refresher lessons. In mid-July of 2001, less than two months before the attacks, one of the lead hijackers, Mohammed Atta, an individual whose uh, inadvertent cockpit audio would later be heard all over the world, met with Ramzi bin al Sheib, uh, who was one of the alleged uh, lead coordinators of the attacks. The pair met in Catalonia, Spain, where they put together the final details of their plan. As Tom said, they were very, very meticulous with who they would and would not uh, allow on board with this this um, operation. Um, they obviously were at risk of the information being leaked, uh, which would have curtailed all of their plans. And they wanted to ensure that everybody was as committed as everybody else to ensure that the coordinated series of attacks would go to plan. Because if one part of them didn't fulfill their end of the bargain, it, it wouldn't have been as effective as it, as it unfortunately later was. What they did when they sat down basically was an overview of the operation which included the final uh, target selection, logistics, weaponry and airport locations. Bin Laden was said to have advised Al Sheib that the main targets were the White House, the two most prominent World Trade Center buildings, as well as the Pentagon, and that he wished for the attacks to occur as soon as possible. Over in America, meanwhile, high-ranking members of the FBI and the CIA, as well as senior counterterrorism officials, began to suspect that a major series of attacks were about to occur and they thought that these attacks were likely to occur in either Saudi Arabia or Israel. But despite information being shared by different members of the CIA that at least two known members of Al-Qaeda had arrived in America, no action or response was given. On top of this, FBI agents in Phoenix and New York sent messages to FBI headquarters alerting them of, quote, the possibility of a coordinated effort by Osama bin Laden to send Al-Qaeda students to the United States to attend civil aviation universities and colleges. Yeah, it'd be a bleak freshers week, that. Very much so, yeah. Or Jaeger bombs. Oh. In these messages, it was suggested by FBI officials that the code name being used for whatever the planned events were was called the Big Wedding. 
And the following month in August, just weeks before the attacks, a flight school in Minnesota contacted the FBI to alert them that an individual by the name of Zacharias Musawi, um, later proven to be a member of Al-Qaeda, had been asking suspicious questions during his flying lessons with the school. So it turned out that these suspicious questions uh, that he was asking his instructor were basically along the lines of, can someone with no previous flying experience uh, have the ability to to fly a commercial airline? Obviously, with um, hindsight, obviously that is a very suspicious thing to ask, but that could be seen as a very just nothing question, couldn't it? It's essentially like how much, like I, if I asked the train driver, how much tra training do you need to really to drive a train? You're not going to go, well, that's a really like dodgy question that I've asked him. It's just a case of kind of, just seems an ignorant question rather than a suspicious one. If you, in my mind yeah yeah i can understand that um apparently he performed really poorly on these lessons as well so they were concerned that you know he was there for maybe other intentions and that's why they made the report but yeah you wouldn't you would assume maybe if i don't know obviously they were right to make the report but as i was just saying like it, it, if it's not exactly the thing it's not it doesn't seem the most sinister of questions, or the way it's worded, perhaps, but... You know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. When when it said that he'd been asking a series of suspicious questions, I, I thought it might be more along the lines of how low can you safely fly yeah. and things like that. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. yeah. So as if all of these warnings were not enough, on the morning of Monday the 6th of August 2001, 36 days before the attacks, George W. Bush was given his daily PDB, which is the President's Daily Brief or the President's Daily Bulletin. Along with his PBJ. <laughs> Yeah, first thing, old George, jumping into that toasty. Um, but this is a, a class of, this is a classified document provided to him by the CIA, provided to any president by the CIA. Uh, and on this date, the document was titled "Bin Laden Determined to Strike in U.S." Uh, the document warned of a very public threats that had been made against America by both bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And as well as this, it outlined a, quote, pattern of suspicious activity in this country consistent with preparations for a hijacking. So yeah, he gets these bulletins every day. They're about um, different briefings to do with national security and world events. And yeah, this on this particular day, it was very clear that something might be going on within their country. Infamously, Bush was on holiday at the time in his ranch in Crawford, Texas, uh, but the bulletin was still delivered to him. No immediate or significant actions were taken. Um, and th this kind of points to one of the conspiracies, Dan, that America was very much aware that this was going to happen and did nothing to kind of deter or stop it from going ahead. Yeah, the conspiracy side is that's that's it's quite obvious. Why why didn't you do something? Why why didn't you put something in place? However, mistakes happen all the time and threats happen all the time. So, yeah, there's a bit of balance for you. Yeah, because I think with that even I'm impressed by the fact that this patterns of activity that seems like the preparation for a hijack and I think even but especially during that period, I mean, obviously hijacking things did happen at that time, but not to this extent. But even being able to see the patterns that could lead to that, I think that's quite impressive to be able to spot that. But um, as Dan said, and we've covered them on numerous cases when it's police, police were aware of this person and they, you know, they were warned about him before. But how long is that list of people that are being warned about and then they're keeping an eye on and who don't do anything? And then the ones that it, it's it's quite simple to say that they didn't they they didn't do anything about it, but. A, what could they definitely have done about it? Because it probably was over a lot of different people that they were saying looked suspicious. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it is a tricky one. It's easy, to, it's easy to kind of put in one light or the other. Yeah, and I think Bush is often like a figure of fun. Like he gets a lot of criticism in the events that took part here and we'll get onto that in our timeline. But as well, that so much of the planning and coordination actually happened overseas and they still had this intelligence that was fairly accurate um, covering obviously such a wide part of the world. So I, I, yeah, it's, it's a tricky one, isn't it? So at this point, the 19 hijackers have been selected and made their way to America. Um, they've received their training and specific instructions about the job that is underhand. America, meanwhile, has received a series of threats and warnings regarding these threats and specific intelligence that has suggested that an attack is likely to take place. Yet no significant actions are taken. And it is here that we move to the timeline of the 9-11 attacks on America. Tuesday, September 11th, 2001, 5.01 a.m. The first known activity on a day that would change the course of history forever takes place. A simple action though it may be, a phone call is made from a phone in Newark, New Jersey, to Boston, Massachusetts. 
The call is between two lead hijackers, both pilots Ziad Jara and Marwan Al Shahi, and it's most likely that the call was made to confirm that all teams were ready to carry out the attacks. At 6.45 a.m., Mohamed Atta, one of the other pilots, and Abdul Aziz Alamari, another hijacker, both arrive at Logan International Airport, having already taken an early morning flight from Maine to Boston. The pair are pictured on an ATM machine in Maine the night before, and also caught an airport surveillance together at Portland International Airport at 5.45 a.m. that morning. The pair make a phone call to Flight 175 hijacking team, likely to confirm arrival and the plans are going ahead, before later boarding Flight 11. 7.18 a.m. Majid Muked and Khalid al midar two members of the Flight 77 hijacking team, both set off security alarms at a checkpoint at Washington Dulles International Airport, and both are given a more thorough search as a result. No further action is taken and the men proceed to departures. And sadly, this would be one of the first security failings of the day. 7.59 a.m. Whilst many millions of American citizens are waking up and going about their day, American Airlines Flight 11, a Boeing 767, departs Logan International Airport in Boston slightly behind schedule and starts to make its way towards its destination, Los Angeles International Airport. The flight is captained by 50-year-old father of three, John Oganowski, and on board the 158-person capacity aircraft are 11 crew members, 76 passengers and five hijackers, including lead hijacker Mohammed Atta. Without considering the five hijackers, the aircraft is 55% full. 8.14 a.m. United Airlines Flight 175, which is also a Boeing 767 and also departing from Logan International Airport in Boston, and also slightly behind schedule, just like Flight 11, departs 14 minutes later than scheduled and it makes its way towards its destination, Los Angeles International Airport. The flight is captained by 51-year-old father of two, Victor Saracini, and on board the 168 capacity aircraft are nine crew members, 51 passengers and five hijackers, including lead hijacker Marwan al Shahi. Without considering the five hijackers, the aircraft is almost 36% full. Between 8.14 and 8.20 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11 is hijacked whilst heading west over central Massachusetts. The hijack is beaten by stabbing two flight attendants, Barbara Arrestegui and Karen Martin, and it is believed they slit the throat of a passenger, Daniel Lewin, for trying to intervene. They do this with makeshift knives and also use mace and the threat of a bomb to fend off other passengers and crew members attempting to stop the assaults. So members of this hijacking were the ones who were double searched at the security but still were able to have these weapons on their person. One hijacker was said to have held up a red item with yellow wires hanging from it while shouting at other passengers to stay back. The hijackers then proceeded to either force their way into the cockpit or were able to get a key to the cockpit from one of the stabbed flight attendants. Once in the cockpit, the hijackers either killed or seriously wounded pilot John Ogonowski and his co-pilot 42-year-old Thomas McGuinness Jr. As the hijackers were predominantly seated and carrying out their attacks in first and business class sections, the passengers and crew towards the rear of the plane did not fully understand what was going on. Many of them believed there was some kind of medical emergency going on and that there wasn't too much to be worried about. This would all quickly change within a matter of minutes. The hijack and his belief have started at 8.14am, exactly as Flight 175 was taken off, with the team having full control of the plane just six minutes later. At 8.19, amidst all the chaos, 45-year-old flight attendant Betty Ong, who had assigned herself to Flight 11 in order to visit her sister in LA and to go on a subsequent holiday to Hawaii with her, made an 8 minute and 26 second call to American Airlines Reservation Center. Using an air phone, Betty relayed the following information. My name is Betty Ong. I'm number three on Flight 11. And the cockpit is not answering their phone. Somebody's staffed in business class and there's we can't breathe in business class. Somebody's got mace or something. I don't know. I think we're getting high death. What in business class? Um, I'm, I'm sitting in the back. Our number one is, got stabbed. Uh, our person is stabbed. Um, nobody knows who stabbed who and we, we can't even get up to business class right now because nobody can breathe. Our first class passengers are uh, first class our uh, galley flight attendant and our purser has been stabbed. And we can't get to the cockpit. The door won't open. Shortly after this call from Betty, who is one of the many hundreds of heroes from the day, the plane performs a more than 90 degree turn and proceeds in the direction of New York. 8.20 a.m. American Airlines Flight 77, this time a Boeing 757, departs from Washington Dulles International Airport. Like the previous two flights, it is slightly behind schedule. The plane begins to make its way towards its destination, Los Angeles International Airport. The flight is captained by 51-year-old Charles Burlingame on the day before his 52nd birthday. 
and on board the 188 passenger capacity aircraft are six crew members, 53 passengers and five hijackers. Without considering the hijackers, the aircraft is a little over 31% full. So yeah, a point that is worth referencing is all four of the flights were significantly below capacity. Um, all of them were below half full. Um, at around the same time, Boston Flight Center controllers decide that Flight 11 has most likely been hijacked. At 8.24 a.m., just five minutes after Betty Ong's call, in an attempt to make a tannoy announcement to the passengers of the plane, Mohammed Atta inadvertently makes the following broadcast, which was heard by air traffic control, confirming their worst fears. Nobody moved. Everything was okay. If you try to make any move, you danger yourself and the airplane. Just stay quiet. Atta would once again accidentally broadcast to air traffic control, with the third and final call stating the following. Nobody move, please. We are going back to the airport. Don't try and make any stupid moves. At 8.37am, numerous different regional air traffic controllers as well as the Air National Guards contact one another, wherein they begin to conduct the launching of numerous F-15 fighter jets in hopes to scramble the hijacked planes. This is where, infamously, one operator can be heard asking, is this real world, not an exercise? Where they are then met with the response, real world, not a test, not an exercise. 8.42am, United Airlines Flight 93, also a Boeing 757, departs from Newark International Airport and makes its way towards its destination, San Francisco International Airport. This flight becomes the most delayed of those involved in the attacks, departing 42 minutes later than its scheduled 8am takeoff. The flight is captained by 43-year-old Jason Dahl, and on board the 182-passenger capacity aircraft are seven crew members, 33 passengers, and four hijackers. Without considering the hijackers, the aircraft is 22% full. At around the same time that Flight 93 took off, United Airlines Flight 175 is hijacked with passengers and crew members being violently assaulted and threatened towards the rear of the aircraft by the hijackers, who are spraying mace, brandishing what appears to be knives, and making bomb threats. Whilst all of this is happening, hijackers Ahmed and Hamza al Gamadi storm the cockpit. In the process of this vicious assault, numerous passengers and flight attendants are stabbed, and both the pilot and co-pilot are murdered. The team had full control of the aircraft within four minutes, and has even narrowly missed multiple head-on collisions with other aircrafts, getting as close as 19 metres in one instance. That's crazy. How coordinated and quick that they are is absolutely terrifying. Because, yeah, four, four minutes for one plane, three minutes for another, six minutes for another. It's all very, very quick. They were all seated fairly close to the cockpit as well, sort of first class and business class. But yeah. even so, for them to do so much damage so quickly and take so much control so quickly is absolutely terrifying. I think it's just because it's such an alien thing, like this kind of thing had never happened. The security protocol, we know, you know, from our own personal experience, how much security in, in airports went, you know, went so intense afterwards, yeah. obviously rightly so, after such an attack. But I imagine there's even, there's a lot more protocols now on planes. And obviously in terms of if anyone wants to do anything or acting suspiciously, we've all probably seen viral videos of people being essentially tied to their chairs from acting suspiciously. So like, yeah. It's, um, or, or perhaps it was too quick and too easy. Just saying. That's Ooh. also true. I remember when I was eight or nine, my parents took us to Florida, and on the flight back, it was like ten percent full, and we got we could sit wherever we wanted. So we obviously sat in first class, and Mum asked if we could go and have a look in the cockpit, and we literally walked there, door open, boom, in. It was like completely different time. Whereas now it's like a series of different, very, very uh, uh, complex locks and codes to actually be able to get in. Like Diagon Alley. It's a bit like Diagon Alley. Mm. I get the reference because I've seen no, it. Dan? Harry Potter, but it's not at all like it. So. Well, yeah, it's, it's really hard to get through it. You need to know what you're doing. If you don't, then you're going to be stuck there. I suppose so. Codes. Yeah. So it's exactly like it. <laughs> um, over the coming minutes, as would be the case with dozens of passengers on this morning, loved ones start to receive phone calls or voicemails from those trapped within hijacked aircrafts. Documentaries would later be made about these phone calls and voicemails. All of them are incredibly emotional, and some of them contain a lot of detail about exactly what was happening on board, with relatives then relaying that information to the police and airport authorities. 8.46am, American Airlines Flight 11 flight attendant Amy Sweeney is on a call to American Airlines flight office, where she makes the following observations about the plane's increasingly erratic movements. Something is wrong. We are in a rapid descent. We are all over the place. I see the water. I see the buildings. I see buildings. We are flying low. We are flying very, very low. 
We are flying way too low. Oh my God, we are way too low. Just 40 seconds later, Flight 11 crashes into the North Tower of the World Trade Center at a terrifying 440 miles per hour. The power and speed of the crash kills all 92 people on board the plane immediately, as well as hundreds of other people between the 92nd and 100th floor of the tower. At least 166 of the large story-sized windows are shattered in the impact, spilling debris onto the South Tower and the streets below. The sound of the impact can be heard for miles as a plane-shaped hole begins to emerge from the smoke and fire. Screams can be heard across the city as crowds gather in shock. Initial reports in the news are that it was a freak accident and that a small twin-engine jet had collided with part of the tower after losing control. Manhattan is under attack, but more is still to come. The blast doesn't only impact those it immediately came into contact with. Smoke and immense heat quickly begins to fill the above floors, whilst ignited jet fuel from the aircraft begins to spill down different elevator shafts and all three stairwells, which are now completely inaccessible, sending a fireball almost 100 floors down to the lobby below, where it kills and severely injures dozens of other people. Yeah, this is the part, there's a, a National Geographic documentary series, it's one of the best I think I've seen on 9-11 and it really graphically displays because i had i didn't even think about this when we first we sort of became aware of 9 11 and were looking at what was going on i didn't even factor in this the spillage and what would the the harm that that would cause and it's there were so many people in the lobby that this essentially spilled out onto and and killed many burnt the skin off many others it's horrific it's strange because we're even going through it yet and us doing more research for it this time around even things that you don't think about people stood outside of the tower and the plane hitting into it and all the debris that would have fallen down on them. You just kind of weirdly you have it all in your head. It's just when it collapses is the damage, which is, and obviously the people on the plane, you don't think of all the other actions of what, you know, people around the area and all the other things that's affected. You just kind of condense it in your head a bit. It's, yeah, it's very bizarre. Those within the building immediately begin to evacuate, but nobody above the 91st floor is able to. New York police and fire departments immediately make their way to the scene. And yeah, this, this particular part of Manhattan can have anywhere between, or back then could have anywhere between 70 to 80,000 people in its general area at any given time between Monday and Friday. And this would obviously include workers, locals, tourists. So the scene, as well as the traffic surrounding the area is incredibly complex for the emergency services to contend with. I find that whole when you get there and you kind of you're you're in Manhattan, you look up and kind of sometimes all you can see is a portion of sky. I find that and you can still see planes nowadays sort of flying around the area. It's to imagine what that scene must have been like for those present. It is absolutely terrifying. I really got from doing the research to this is people saying how you know that the Twin Towers are such part of them of New York as you know, part of the skyline. It was such an iconic thing and like how. It's just left a big hole within them as a, as a city, just because that that you know uh, that's completely gone. And yeah, seeing like a seeing such a significant building that you know represents New York um, it, being attacked, it's like it's quite a metaphor in terms of them all being under attack. Yeah, hundred percent. Flight 11, together with victims claimed by its impact and the aftermath of its impact, becomes the most deadly plane crash as well as single act of terrorism in human history, eventually claiming around 1,600 lives, with an estimated 1,426 still being stuck on the top 18 floors. Creator of the television show Frasier, David Angel, was on board the plane. Actor Mark Wahlberg was due to be on this flight but changed his plans the day before, whilst Family Guy creator Seth MacFarlane was due to be on the flight but overslept and arrived at the airport too late to board due to a hangover. It's a lot of famous people. Yeah. Mm. There's been some people that had claimed to be in the towers when it happened when they weren't. But 8.51am, American Airlines Flight 77 is hijacked whilst flying over Ohio. The hijackers are able to seize control of the aircraft within three minutes. Unlike the previous two hijackings, the hijackers were said to have been carrying box cutters and no passengers or crew were attacked or murdered in the process of the hijacking. The group removed both the pilot and co-pilot from the cockpit before forcing all the passengers and crew to the rear of the plane. Once there, two hijackers blocked them off and began threatening them with knives and bombs. The plane immediately deviated from its set route and began heading towards Washington, D.C. 8.55 a.m. U.S. President George W. Bush is in attendance at Emma E. Booker Elementary School in Florida as part of a scheduled and televised visit to promote his policy on improved education. Bush is due to read My Pet Goat to a classroom full of children. 
when it is informed that a small twin engine plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. Despite this news, Bush proceeds to enter the classroom. 9am, Flight 175 passenger Peter Hansen makes his second and what would be his final phone call to his father. Emotionally, he states the following. It's getting bad, Dad. A stewardess was stabbed. They seem to have knives and mace. They said they have a bomb. It's getting very bad on the plane. Passengers are throwing up and getting sick. The plane is making jerky movements. I don't think the pilot is flying the plane. I think we are going down. I think they intend to go to Chicago or some place and fly into a building. Don't worry, Dad. If it happens, it will be very fast. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. Just as this phone call was ending, Peter's father could hear a neighbour screaming. He turned on his television and witnessed his son's plane, American Airlines Flight 175, crashing directly into the South Tower of the World Trade Center. And it did this at 590 miles per hour, killing all 65 people on board instantly, as well as killing and severely injuring several hundred people between the 77th and 85th floor. And yeah, as, as Tom mentioned as well, there were so many people injured and, and even killed from falling debris um, from the impact. The impact was at such speed and ferocity that parts of the plane, including its engine, went right through the tower and were found on the ground floor a further six blocks away. As so many people, including live television broadcasts, were already watching smoke and fire emanate from the North Tower, this impact makes it clear that this was no accident and that America is under attack. Shock and chaos fill the streets as injured people flee both towers, whilst hundreds of other people remain trapped inside. Unlike the North Tower, one stairwell was not impacted by the crash, enabling some to make their way to safety. So one small positive note to make amidst all this chaos is that between the time that the first tower was struck and the time that the second tower was struck, it is estimated that 2,900 people left the South Tower through fears of what was going on at the North Tower. Uh, and these are 2,900 people that likely would have been killed had they remained inside. And as well as this, obviously, after the impact, there was still one stairwell open. So there were, although it was a completely chaotic scene, there was some slight fortune within uh, the South Tower in that there was one means of escape, but there were still people trapped within both towers. Hundreds of first responders attended the scene, many of whom began making their way up the thousands of stairs within each of the towers, bringing those trapped or injured to safety whilst continually climbing higher. Unfortunately, these heroes would ultimately also end up trapped within the buildings. 9.05am, whilst about to make a start to my pet goat, President Bush is interrupted by his chief of staff who whispers in his ear that the second tower has been hit and that America is under attack. If it feels it's very George Bush to be in this situation, essentially being, you know, reading a, a children's story while such an important thing, such a vital thing is happening to his country. But Bush pauses for a good 10 seconds or so before continuing on with his book, which is baffling here. I mean, you can see the cogs turning when he's being told what's happening. You'd have thought that's him leave the, leave there, go straight into his car, make his way to go, you know, have some important meetings and try and figure out what's going on and what's the best way to defend his country. Though he would later receive intense criticism for this, he claims he did this as to not alarm the children he was reading to. I mean, I feel like the whole, there's a lot more at stake there. You could just say to the children, you've got to go for another reason. It doesn't need to be they don't need to have the full context of what's going on you can just leave you are the president of the united states i'm sure they would understand my pet goat can wait <laughs> yeah i think um i think it's a no one before or since has kind of been in a situation like that um not not saying i would have done the same but you can you probably want to know what the ending of my pet goat was so you're like yeah i mean i've not I still don't know, to be fair, but I just, I think, I think like Tom said, you can definitely see him processing that or trying to process that information. And you can, although his face remains somewhat straight, you can still kind of see all the emotions go through him. Uh, I just, yeah, I feel, I feel really sorry for anyone put in that situation because what can, what can you do? But yeah, I, I, I think you can get up and leave. And but roll the damn conspiracy thing here. Well, I was just about to say, I was about to say, it does certainly fuel the conspiracy there because you're witnessing a president being told this insane information and him just there, just, just sitting there as if like he expected it perhaps or he kind of... Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's strange. He could have just, he doesn't need to panic. He just get up, go, sort it out. Yeah, I think uh, it does lead, It does kind of lean me into that camp slightly for that because essentially that's happened. So yeah, we're in, we're in progress in terms of what we're... You know the plan. It's 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 quite a jarring 
Jaron Scene. 9.28 a.m. United Airlines Flight 93 becomes the fourth and final aircraft to be hijacked on 9-11. Due to it occurring nearly 43 minutes after the first plane had struck the World Trade Center, some calls and messages have been relayed to crew members and passengers of Flight 93. After the hijackers made their way to the cockpit, they overpowered the pilots and forced them to the rear of the plane with the other passengers and crew, stabbing one passenger fatally in the process. As the hijackers were making bomb threats and wielding knives, the rest of those on board began to hatch a plan. While simultaneously sending messages and making calls to their loved ones, over the next 30 minutes the plane would make its way towards Washington. 9.37am, 46 minutes after being hijacked, American Airlines Flight 77 makes a 330 degree turn before being crashed directly into the western flank of the Pentagon, and it did this at a speed of 530 miles per hour. The impact killed all 64 people on board immediately, whilst killing 125 people in the Pentagon and injuring an additional 106 people. The only piece of footage showing the impact was caught by a nearby security camera, which, yeah, infamous this this was the first conspiracy theory I remember hearing even as a kid that the, the first bit of information that was questioned is that many people sort of stated it's a dubious piece of footage due to the fact that you can't actually really see the plane itself but then you see the explosion you can see what appears to be some form of object but then the explosion so that's the one that I remember from it and I remember the it not being made available or readily available at one point and it being like seized and this was the big red flag for me because um, I can understand how fast that plane is going. Perhaps that camera could have, you know, frames per second, blah, blah, blah. You yeah. might not be able to see the. But the amount of cameras that must be in that area, and yeah. they've all been um, taken away, hidden, whatever. Why the secrecy over all those other individual cameras? Lieutenant Commander David Tarantino, who was amongst those first to arrive at the scene and attempt to rescue the wounded, described the following. In this area... It's so hot that the debris is melting and dripping off the ceiling onto your skin, and it would sear your skin and melt your uniform. We went a little farther, turned a corner, and came into this bombed out office space that was a roaring inferno of destruction and smoke and flames, an intense heat you could feel searing your face. Meanwhile, back in New York, smoke was now billowing out of each of the two towers and forming a dark cloud over the iconic Manhattan skyline. People close to the impact zone were now hanging out of the windows, gasping for air and waving items of clothing in hopes of being spotted for rescue. Helicopters attempt to get near the towers and even consider landing on the roofs, but the smoke and the heat proves to be too much. As more and more firefighters and rescue workers enter the trade centre, more and more civilians emerge from within and congregate on the streets before being rushed to medical facilities. Two minutes after the Pentagon was hit, Zayad Jarrah, the lead hijacker of Flight 93, is heard by US air traffic control making the following inadvertent broadcast, confirming that there is a fourth hijacked plane in the skies. Ladies and gentlemen, hear the captain, please sit down. Keep remaining seating. We have a bomb on board, so sit. This is the captain. I would like you all to remain seated. We have a bomb on board and we're going back to the airport and have our demands. So please remain quiet. It's almost as well because there's a, there's similarities here with Mohammed Atta's uh, broadcast. So it's almost as if they have a pre-prepared kind of script that they're going to deliver or they've been told to use the intercom or, t- or the, what they thought was the intercom to make these announcements. Do you not think? Yeah, I think um, they've definitely... It's like, And not to give any kind of, obviously not praising in any way but it's such an orchestrated attack they the fact that all of them have not been north of five minutes six minutes to, to take the plane over completely essentially because as well um i think that whilst in the research with this someone made a point and i think it's very interesting and, and um important is planes weren't really used as weapons before as in like using the plane itself as a weapon flying into something that's very new usually when it comes to the kind of protocol on a plane with a hijacking is to remain calm it's to let them do what they're doing because they're going to land the plane. They're going to try and, you know, take get money from people or whatever by landing the plane. And, um, you know, and that's essence. So the kind of protocol for the people on the plane is actually to remain calm, to stay seated, then reassuring them that, you know, it's going to be fine, et cetera, et cetera, if, as long as they just follow the demands. This whole thing is very new. The idea of, of them, if they don't act, is going to, you know, lead to mass deaths and whatnot. It, it was, yeah, I think it's, it's hard not to look at this now with 9-11 you know have, having happened within our lifetime and how much that's changed how we perceive things mm-hmm. a lot more an innocent time at that before that stage yeah absolutely yeah 
At 9.41am, almost an hour after being struck by the first plane, for some, particularly those in the upper floors, the heat and smoke within the towers is becoming impossible to escape. It is estimated that between 100 to 200 people jump from the North Tower, falling at least 90 stories to their deaths. Now this is a really thing I've, you know, it's, it's remained in my head, all those pictures of, you know, the blurry zoomed in pictures of people actually jumping from the buildings. I think at first you kind of think it's debris or people throwing things out of the building. But once you realize that's people who can't take any more and they've decided to take their own lives by jumping out of that building, it's really, you know, it's, it's hard to watch and hard to imagine being in that mindset. Did you, did you see the documentary, The Falling Man? Yeah. Amazing. Um, I don't know if you've seen the picture, Tom, of like a really iconic photo of somebody falling, but in a really kind of elegant way, as if like he's kind of just accepted his fate. And the documentary is about trying to find that person and his history and his background and stuff. And it's yeah, fascinating. Some also begin to do the same in the South Tower, though the number is believed to have been much smaller, with some stating that between 3 to 18 people were sighted. One of these unfortunately landed directly on top of firefighter Danny Sir as he prepared to enter the tower killing him instantly. New Yorkers watched on in horror. Um, and at 9.41am, um, as Dan just mentioned, the fallen man photo is taken of a man jumping from the North Tower. The man is believed to have been a chef in one of the upper floor restaurants, but has never been identified. Though many believe him to have either been Jonathan Brealey or Norberto Hernandez, both of whom worked at the Windows on the World restaurant. Just two minutes after this photo was taken, both the White House and the Capitol building were officially evacuated. As Dan mentioned, the Fallen Man documentary is, I found that really, that one, and the uh, voices of 9-11, the, the phone call and voicemail one, found those to be really captivating to watch. And the, the, Dan's right, the photo is very striking. I think Elton John bought the original print of it. Um, but it's like, he, there's a very, there's kind of a grace and acceptance to to it um it's an interesting move by the paper as well isn't it because obviously loads of the papers were just displaying the towers and the explosion and stuff um and i can't remember what the the, the paper was do you remember the name of the i don't remember the name but it was was it front page i believe they it was printed. front page and it yeah the, the falling man was front page and they got a lot of slack for it but it, I, th I think it, it does humanize the event it really kind of brings it back to reality at 9.59am, 56 minutes after the impact of Flight 175, the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. As the deafening noise of the collapse slowly fades away, massive clouds of grey-white dust and debris pour through the streets of Manhattan. Many onlookers initially mistake it yet for another explosion or impact in the chaos, as the resultant smoke had completely engulfed where the South Tower once stood, but as the wind disperses the haze, it becomes evident that the building had completely vanished. Tragically, no one inside the South Tower during its collapse manages to survive and many more are killed or trapped by fallen debris, including Father Michael Judge, who was chaplain in the New York Fire Department, who was struck and killed by a fallen piece of the building. At 10.03 a.m., back on board Flight 93, with limited communication and awareness of the unfolding attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, the passengers realized the grave threat posed by the hijackers and bravely made the decision to confront them. In a display of courage and selflessness, a large group launched a counterattack, forcing their way into the cockpit and engaging in a struggle for the control of the aircraft. Ultimately, Flight 93 nosedived before crashing into a field near Shanksville, Pennsylvania, killing all 44 people on board instantly. The passengers overwhelmed the hijackers, sacrificing their own lives to prevent the plane from reaching its intended target, which yeah, many people believe to have been either the White House or the Capitol building. Their heroic actions saved countless lives that morning and inspired a nation in the face of unspeakable tragedy, with cockpit recordings capturing the final moments. And yeah, this is a trigger warning. We're going to play them. It's, it's a very upsetting piece of audio. So, yeah, amongst the heroes there was an individual called Todd Beamer who was overheard um, via one phone call that was ongoing saying, let's roll, before the passengers then stormed the cockpit. And, yeah, th there's so many heroes from this day. Um, but, yeah, he was definitely up there with one of them. 10.28 a.m., one hour and 42 minutes after the impact of Flight 11, the North Tower of the World Trade Center also collapses, destroying the Marriott Hotel at the base of it and destroying a portion of the south side of seven World Trade Center building, causing it to become partially engulfed by flames in the process. This is the second major red flag for me. So one is the Pentagon being struck and the lack of 
visual visual footage around it and the second one is uh, World Trade Center 7 um, collapsing it, yeah I mean the, the thing I found strange was that it was it, so that what 1028 is when it's first being set ablaze by the collapse of the North Tower but it doesn't fall down until like seven hours later mm. there's very little evidence is that right of the actual footage of it happening you can just see kind of part of the building as it goes down and it looks very controlled it yeah i mean i'll get into this later because i don't believe the twin towers were uh, uh used by you know demolition or controlled demolition but yeah world traders and a seven looks very controlled um and I just wouldn't expect, even if the fire was very intense and had been struck by debris, the whole building to fall like that. Mm. And why just that building? But it's yeah. a tricky one. It's a tricky mm. one. I can, yeah, I can understand that. So in a bit of a, uh, a contrast to the South Tower collapse, um, everybody above the 91st floor was still trapped at the time of the collapse. However, the difference here is that 19 people uh, had survived and were actually able to be pulled from the debris afterwards. And the final person to be pulled from the rubble would actually be a lady called Janelle Guzman, um, who actually spent 27 hours trapped in the rubble before rescuers were able to reach her and free her. Um, and there's a VR experience. This experience puts you under the um, remains of the towers on Ground Zero and it puts you kind of, J Janelle narrates it. It's, if you have access to a VR headset, if you want to borrow uh, mine and Tom's, then uh, it's well worth a watch because it shows you in VR perspective the planes hitting and it yeah it puts you in amongst her descriptions of um, of the rubble and it's it's also terrifying. I found that odd that they've done that. Yeah, I get. I there's been video games made that have certainly have been questioned in in terms of bad taste. Um, they put you inside the the tower, the office box that she worked in as well, and you can just mm. see papers scattering, like raining down outside the window. Um, yeah, I don't know how I feel about that. Does it include the moment of collapse? Um, no, the screen goes just... black then, and then it it fades in to then fire metal concrete and just darkness and her narrating her experience because she had like a she claimed to have had like a sort of encounter with god whilst down there um, and started hallucinating um she was severely injured she'd had well, one of her legs was crushed she her head was significantly swollen her face was burnt um but she kept seeing a bit of light she could hear walkie talkies she could hear rescue workers and yeah 27 hours she was she was mm -hmm. pinned there Mm. Um, but um, she fortunately recovered and although doctors at one point considered amputating her leg she had surgery and was able to save it and she, she now does motivational talks and obviously she's helped to create this VR experience as well but she would recall the following Everything just went boom Everything was crumbling and was just coming on top of me I felt like I was there forever I thought I was dreaming I just figured this has to be a dream This is not happening and I didn't know if anybody was going to find me. I just laid there. At 5.20pm, almost seven hours after being struck by a huge cloud of falling debris from the North Tower, Number 7 World Trade Center building collapses. And yeah, as Dan said, this is one that has also drawn a lot of conspiracy theories. Fortunately, there were no deaths or injuries as a result of this, as the building and the surrounding area had long since been evacuated as a precaution. 8.30pm, after spending the majority of the day aboard Air Force One, President Bush addresses the nation in a televised broadcast from the White House. He said the following. Today, our fellow citizens, our way of life, our very freedom came under attack in a series of deliberate and deadly terrorist acts. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbored them. To go back onto the uh, My Pet Goat as well, the author hit out at the sort of fame that the book received um, because apparently it's not called My Pet Goat, it's called The Pet Goat, and he was a bit... It's The Pet Goat, get it right. Ah, so sorry, we've done the same thing. The pet goat. 
By this point, vast amounts of concrete, steel and other buildings debris had formed what is now known as Ground Zero. Rescue efforts went on for numerous weeks, with thousands of people reported missing. Ultimately, the 9-11 attacks claimed the lives of 2,977 people, with many victims dying over the coming weeks, months and years as a result of injuries sustained or materials inhaled as a result of the attacks. Yeah, I was going to say, recently when I went to New York on the TV, there saw adverts for insurance companies with people affected by you know, 9-11, if you're affected by it in terms of, um, you know, any respiratory problems and things, it's still very much a thing affecting people today, uh, making it the deadliest terrorist attack in human history. Over the coming weeks, fingers will be pointed in numerous different directions, including that of a group of Croatian nationalists, but Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda would eventually claim responsibility for the attacks, despite initially denying it. In the aftermath of the September 11, 2001 attacks, the removal of more than 100,000 tonnes of debris from Ground Zero became a monumental task, taking a total of more than eight months to complete and symbolising both of the physical and emotional recovery of New York City and the nation in the process. Over the course of most of 2002, thousands of workers laboured tirelessly to clear the site, sitting through the rubble with painstaking care to recover human remains and personal belongings. As the cleanup efforts progressed, plans for a fitting a memorial to honour the victims and heroes of 9-11 began to take shape. In their place, two vast memorial fountains were constructed in what was once the foundations of the towers, marking the footprints of the fallen twin towers. Cascading with water and surrounded by the names of nearly 3,000 individuals who lost their lives that fateful day. The memorial fountains of Ground Zero were opened to the public on September 12, 2011, one day after the 10-year anniversary. Yeah, that, um, the sort of clean-up effort of, of Ground Zero, I remember on the news of the next day where they were showing footage of them actually having to, like, they had industrial, numerous industrial diggers there and they had to spray them with water whilst they were sort of excavating because the heat, the, the, um, the force of the heat still coming from the site would have actually eventually stop the diggers from working or melted mm. melted through them which is yeah it's unbelievable that that much heat was still prominent in the area yeah i think as i know a lot of people think that perhaps they should have went to try and rebuild the towers as kind of like a a stand against what had happened but um i mean i'm sure a lot of people who listen to this have been to grand zero so it's a very powerful place when you're there and kind of especially in you know in how built up uh, new york is when you kind of see this vast space which once was occupied by the two towers is a very powerful powerful thing definitely so that was a timeline of events for the 9 11 attacks we're now producer dan going to move on to conspiracies but first of all let me clarify like i did at the top of the episode i'm now away i'm not a conspiracy theorist anymore but i feel like i am fairly well versed in it so yeah, I mean, Tom has mentioned the Zeitgeist series, Dan mentioned the Loose Change series. So both of those are, uh, if you are interested in really immersing yourself in, in the world of conspiracies, they are worth a watch. There's also Where Did the Towers Go by Dr. Judy Wood. So our, I can pop links to all of these in our uh, Facebook group. Um, but we'll start, yeah, we'll start with some of the more commonly believed theories uh, before going on to some quite... Um, quite outlandish ones so mm. first of all then guys inside job or the fact that it was a false flag so according to this theory elements within the u.s government or other powerful national entities a lot of focus towards israel on this i found um, had foreknowledge of the attacks and allowed them to happen or actively participated in orchestrating them as a pretext for launching wars in the middle east or expanding government control domestically and gaining oil and money um, so George Bush was very quickly considered to have allowed these attacks to happen with many quickly pointing to the televised the pet goat moment in order to quote finish what his father started so yeah, he was very as much as a figure of fun he was also painted as somewhat of a villain uh, by some people in, in the days and weeks that followed I don't I, I, I'm similar to Dan in the sense that I was a lot more heavily leading towards conspiracy um, when I was younger um, I'm still, I'm not 180 on it. I'm probably like 150 if you want to put a number on it. Um, I don't believe that it was self-inflicted in the sense that, that it was assisted in terms of, you know, they planted bombs themselves and did it and then blamed Al-Qaeda retrospectively. I think you still have to question though in regards to them knowing certain things were happening and maybe not taking the right action there. But as Dan said, that could be just making them make a mistake. I'm going back and forth. I'm, I'm yo-yoing a bit here. But um, and George, the George Bush not reacting straight away 
I still think is very odd. And I know, you know, we've said a million times about how people react in certain situations very differently and you can't really, it's hard to judge, but as the President of the United States, or even someone who's advising him, you go, you know, we need to act on this now. I think, I think there's, it's not an alien concept, essentially letting things to happen in order for you to be able to retaliate and retaliate hard. Um, so, I th yeah, <laughs> that's not an answer. I, I feel like in that moment, I know, yeah, I think Bush was just generally out of his depth in that moment um, and completely overwhelmed. But, um, I, yeah, this isn't one too much that I would, would buy into, but I know, Dan, you might have a, a different opinion. I just, a bit like you, Tom, initially I was like, yeah, it's the government. Of course it is. But I feel like that's a really easy response. Um, but saying that, who knows what happens under the table nowadays, the corruption mm. involved. And, you know, it wouldn't surprise me that much. But I just think uh, it's a bit like the moon landing conspiracy, which um, I'd like to hear your thoughts, guys, uh, whether you think it's a conspiracy or not. Um, I'm very much a believer in the moon landing. But it's such a big thing, I think, to keep as a like under wraps or keep under government control or whatever people think that it's, it's been faked or whatnot. It's such a big thing. Mm -hmm. to not let you know something slip or it's uh, it, it can't be an inside job yeah I know what you mean I mean the moon landing one is probably more believable than this being an inside job and it being faked I think is probably more believable than 9-11 that's a whole different can of worms um, I'm so, I just want to retaliate to that so bad so why haven't just... they gone back up there why are they not up there doing more regular things in the moon that's the only thing I'm a bit like to do what to do what yeah, to do what? What, what well, I mean, they, back they didn't then, do it was a lot when they were there, did they? They just jumped around. Oh, a bit exactly. Because there's, there's not a lot to do on the moon, really. It's so incredibly hard to live on the moon or to live on Mars, which is why it hasn't happened, and it costs so much money to do it now. Nowadays. Yeah, but the amount of money spent on other things, mate. I'm sure they've got some moon money somewhere. What, so you're saying they should just yeah spend a load of cash just to go to the moon? There's again. a lot of shit we spend cash on at the moment, mate. That doesn't make any sense. But and the moon makes more sense to you. Yeah. More interesting. I'd rather know what's going on over there than spending billions on PBI that never used, never used. Well, I think if you if you look at the world in context, I don't think anybody's got the money to do that right now. Maybe Elon Musk. It's been a long time, Dan. Been a long um, time they've had some money but, there. <laughs> but back then, it was a space race. It was something to prove. Um, That's why I th I'm questioning it because it was a race, and they're going like, "Oh, we've got to do it." But then, do you think <laughs> all like the engineering documents, all the kind of the the training? Everything that was involved in to, to get to the moon was all faked. By the way, I'm not. I'm saying it's more believable. I'm not saying 100% think yeah. that, that. But I just think there's some elements of that which I'm still like. Eh. But um, yes, I think we've all agreed that we think that it's not an inside job in terms of America on itself. But and I'm probably still more in the camp of maybe they knew some things were happening and they kind of let it happen in mm. order to be able to react. Is my stance on it. incompetence. Yeah, I think there's definitely, there's so many warnings and... Um... Mine's not incompetence, mine's more of a, if it happens, then that's fine, because we're going right, to yeah, yeah. retaliate more. My, mine is incompetence, unsurprisingly. <laughs> okay, so we've covered inside job and, and false flag. Let's move on then to a very popular one, which is the controlled demolition. So this theory suggests that the collapses of... Uh, both towers as well as tower seven was not solely caused by the impact of the hijacked planes but rather by controlled demolitions using explosives that were pre-planted within the buildings the main argument with this was initially regarding the burning temperature of jet fuel and the strength of the tower's steel frame as well as the fact that people could see what they believed appeared to be numerous implosions from certain floors or a certain series of floors scattered down as the towers collapse so as the debris is mm. falling and the smoke cloud is growing you can see what looks like windows bursting on probably every 10th floor um this is one that uh, there's a lot of science involved in debunking it um so for me i i can understand it's a very quick conspiracy to sort of draw towards and grab and say yes controlled demolition they did it but i think the science that is out there and available at the moment suggests that this was simply the case of the frame of structure getting too hot, the heat going through the structure, warping it, 
and then it's fallen. I mean, even the, we mentioned earlier Ramzi Youssef, the, the World Trade Center, he planted a bomb at the bottom in the basement of one of them. Obviously not with the impact of a, 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 a um, commercial plane, but it still did very little to even sh rock the foundation of the building. Some people compare it to uh, a plane that had previously hit into the Empire State Building and it didn't cause this damage. Um, but that was because the Empire State Building's um, way it was built was completely different to the Twin Towers. Twin Towers is made from a lot kind of lighter materials in order to make it so it, it was able to be so tall in the sense that, you know, it wasn't, otherwise it'd be insanely heavy or whatever. I can't explain it in, a, in the, the right kind of terms, but it's di basically a completely different way and foundations were made. and it was made in such a way that it was actually a lot kind of um not thinner material but you know lighter weight material in comparison to the empire state building so yeah i was always a bit like this one was one that like you said very easy to cling on to there's lots of things they can point to and go why is it like this and why is this like this and you kind of go oh that yeah that is strange but um the way it's fallen it's like as soon as it's fallen from the top it's like you then go go from like three foot like one floor falls down and it knocks down three more than the in hand of the next one it's like the way it falls down it kind of does make sense also to go back to the um empire state one as well the plane that hit it was a b25 which is a, a drop in the ocean compared to uh 747 or 757 mm. But still, I agree with this, this building shape and structure is different. But yeah, it's all the weight as well. Once that, once it does give way at top, the concrete and the steel falling is obviously going to crush yeah. what's below it and then gain momentum. The you know the further it falls. I guess the way I, I mean, as well as it's designed, obviously, is, is to if that did happen, it would do that. But I think I, I guess from an absolute, like you, you're probably very aware from the way I'm talking about uh, buildings and made, are made. But I would have assumed that a plane would hit it and then it would fall like a tree, like fall sideways off, is how I would initially have thought that would happen. But um, again, that's coming because I have zero knowledge in the terms of that. Uh, no, I literally thought of the same thing this morning, but the, if you're cutting a tree down, you'd typically go towards the bottom and you'd, yeah. the angle that you hit it at, or did, you'd want to then, you'd remove an angle from the side opposite to where you're then cutting for it to fall. Mm. <sighs> I, I immediately, there's so much conspiracies. There's so many zoomed in, super slow motioned, like little pops of windows coming out, which obviously aren't little windows. They're giant story sized windows with significant force. But I just, I can't, people are looking for things to blame or, or, or yeah. not to buy into the official narrative. But what, what are you saying, Dan, on this one? Well, I think in the, with the windows, I think loose change lent on that quite a lot, didn't they? The explosions coming out. Um, I think. I mean, if, you th if you're in like a house, for example, and you're on the top floor and somebody closes the bottom floor door, it, you, you know, you can have doors opening up on just mm. because of air pressure. And that is a very contained, very controlled building just made up with glass. Things are obviously going to blow out as the tower falls down because of just yeah. the immense pressure. Yeah. And I think also one of the, again, I think easy arguments is people going like, well, sh yeah, the, the fuel can't melt steel. It just doesn't happen. But what it can do is significantly weaken the steel within the building and the way it was built inside um, is basically the foundation is the, the structure of the building was in the core wasn't it like you, like you said Tom rather on the outside the main bit was on the middle yeah. that became weak very very weak and just kind of squashed inside and I've got a very interesting video by an engineer called Andres Barilla um, which will pop on screen now which shows a very zoomed in uh, video of the towers um, and you can see you can see the warping of the building from the inside, uh, and I think this video it kind of makes sense why they fell like that. Although I can see it looks very controlled, very kind of it falls in a very uniform manner, yes. but it kind of makes sense if you look at the engineering side of things. Wonder why the twin towers collapsed the way they did. As an architect, I want to show you evidence through structural analysis. To grasp this, you first need to understand their construction. Traditional skyscrapers had a sturdy core and columns throughout the floor, but the Twin Towers had an innovative design. The columns expanded outwards to leave more space inside. So beams, green beams connected the facade to the core. After the impact, part of the structure was destroyed, but the notes found a redistribution. The tower stood firm. The real issue was the fire. The fuel weakened these green beams. This actually caused the facade to deform inwards. The facade compromised the upper floor's exerted pressure pressure starting a domino effect. Check out this simulation. The colors represent the same elements. You can see how the collapse initiates and spreads. 
As you can see in this original footage, the course that's still for a few seconds before it collapsed into. Definitely. So are we all turning our noses up to the idea of a controlled demolition? I'm not turning my nose up because if people want to believe it, you're all welcome in your own beliefs. But I think, yeah, my head now is more in line with, yeah, it's just the way that the, the building was built and that's, it was kind of designed as well if it was to fall, to fall that way as well rather yeah. than another way. Okay, cool. So then we move on to the Pentagon missile. Uh, so this was, as we mentioned earlier, one of the very first conspiracies to be born from 9-11. Many theorists assert that the damage to the Pentagon was not caused by American Airlines Flight 77, as officially stated, but rather by a missile or explosive device. They point to the surveillance footage to back this up, showing frame by frame in super slow motion that it's very hard to see a plane. And as Dan said, this is one of the most heavily surveyed buildings in America and there's only one piece of surveillance footage that has been publicly disclosed so Pentagon missile what are your thoughts doing cases we have done in the past especially um, with, with CCTV and whatnot frame rates are all over the shop and they can be you know so it not being clear I think is absolutely understandable because um, even yes, I'm walking down the street, it can be like suddenly they've gone 20 foot in the next second, and it's like yeah. So that to me is fairly explainable. Um, I think I do find it odd that they've either seized or it's been not shared the other surveillance footage. Um, I'm not sure exactly why, and I think it's bizarre it hasn't been explained. But again, even with the missile, it's like okay. That would mean us thinking it's it's the um, self-inflicted um, them doing it themselves, um, the inside job theory, which is one that I'm not paying much credence to. And you know, everyone who on these planes have this. I know, I know people really deep in this rabbit rabbit hole would disagree with this, but people on all these flights have been accounted for, uh, the pilots have been accounted for, um, and all the victims have. So, it, yeah, you're essentially going, oh well they've created a whole list of people who didn't exist and yeah. all their families didn't exist and all their stuff didn't exist in order for that to have happened. The, the other thing is on both the towers during obviously the moment from uh, impact onwards there's very clearly like sort of plane shaped cavities that appear kind of within the building whereas with the Pentagon it's much more of a kind of almost like a U slanted U or V shape um, and the only sort of plain debris that could be found were very like small pieces of plane mm. like almost like shrapnel um so i i think there there must be other footage of the impact there, there has to be right that's either yeah. been classified or or whatnot but i remember this as a kid as you said tom i remember this coming out and being a very thing oh no you know it was going around the school like no it wasn't it was a missile they did it to themselves it was you know mm. But I agree with you. There's, there's, yeah. I mean, all of these as well. The whole thing being a state, any anything going into theories where actually there was no people on the plane or it was a missile or whatever. There's there's flight logs and there's family members yeah. to you know audio evidence to testify that there was. So yeah, again, this is one that at the time I remember leaning into a bit as a kid. But it just it is, is it too? It, I feel like it's too bizarre to have been anything else the thing is i know we don't ha the general public don't necessarily have a right to see this stuff but it is strange why they just don't release some sort of additional angle slash footage just to <laughs> put it to bed yeah, it's back at their own story essentially i find that bizarre yeah, yeah. And, and the only thing of that particular piece of footage i do find it strange that i from what i can remember is the angle of attack it seems so low to the ground if it's yeah it's a, a five a 757 Boeing aircraft seems quite that seems really skilled to be able to get it that low to the ground and so precise into that it's quite a low building as well so yeah it took out yeah it took out a series of telephone posts and lampshades on its way um so there are there are there was this other evidence which people again argue that if it was a missile it had just gone straight through <sighs> okay so we, we're all saying no to pentagon missile i don't know Oh, we got some. Idea. Yeah, like Dan said, is is it, that's the, the flying so low, and it, it would require a very skilled person to be able yeah. to do that, pull that off. Um, yeah, that one's a bit, still a bit odd, a bit odd. fishy. 
bit fishy and odd. Okay. Yeah. And there's also as well, Dan, you'll, you'll, you know how I think I've mentioned it on a previous episode before, but I, I've, I told you I fall asleep to some weird things. I once fell asleep to a real time animation of the sinking of the Titanic. There's real time. Ti- there's I've some- done that too, Ben lovely okay good that makes me feel better but there's some but did you put it on dan to go to bed or did you just fall asleep if you're watching it good question i don't remember it i imagine you're on the sofa just falling asleep whilst watching it rather than in putting bed. on to have a nice dream it's probably on the tv actually yeah yeah oh, okay yeah I'm, I'm i'm it's soothing me into um okay so but, but cold they, icy death <laughs> be, um so there are some very 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 good uh youtube creators that have pieced together real time um flight simulators of each of the hijacked um, planes and their flight paths are all accurate and then they basically whilst all of this is going on they sort of piece together all four planes taking off their flight paths the hijacking and they overlay key events of the timeline including audios from the cockpit phone calls from um, air traffic control um, and then clips of actual real time it's very meticulous how they've done it but um the the one the one that does go because there's questions raised around obviously the pentagon flight and the um field in pennsylvania flight when this um flight simulator youtuber has put this all together the skill as dan said for all of these flight well obviously not flight 93 but the other flights that it takes significant effort not to either lose control of 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 the plane or hit anything else on on the way so it's 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 terrifying how well orchestrated it all was and how accurate it all was. Again, I can I can pop that in uh, in the Facebook group. Um, okay, so Pentagon missile is a bit of a dubious one. Let's move on then to one that hopefully we can rule out: remote controlled planes. Some theorists believe that hijacked planes were actually equipped with remote controlled technology, allowing them to be piloted by someone other than the hijackers themselves, and that there were no actual hijackers and, in some cases, passengers and crew. This has obviously very quickly been debunked via air traffic recordings, family members, flight logs, airport surveillance and passports that were later found at the scene. So we can we can rule that one out? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I- that it gets to the point of being just being so disrespectful to the families and of the victims to say like they never existed and this, this thing didn't happen and I think but at that stage I mean obviously now we have drones and a lot larger drones and they, I just don't believe the technology was there quite there for that to even be a possibility yep okay so again probably even more disrespectful to the families the no plane theory so this theory claims that the planes seen crashing into the world trade center and the pentagon were actually missiles that were in the shape of planes or that they were in fact holograms or computer generated images and that no actual aircraft were involved in the attacks and uh, they claim that any home movie recordings or handheld photos taken of it were propaganda i see a lot of this on instagram like you open the comment section on a 9-11 video and it's faked CGI. What well, it's, it's, I find it nuts. Mm. Absolutely nuts that people can so confidently stand by that. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, the fact that so many different countries, news reports, also having the footage and, you know, filming and stuff themselves and have, and it would mean a lot more people need to be in on this if it was CGI. Yeah. Um, so yeah. It's just a a straight no from me. Okay, Uh, so we then move on to stand down order. So according to this theory, high level officials within the US government issued a stand down order to prevent military intervention or interception of the hijacked planes, allowing the attacks to proceed unimpended. Um, And basically the F-15 jets that were sent to scramble simply provided a motorcade in the sky. I mean, it it does paint, give a clear like, why didn't they order it if they knew the ones were hijacked? I mean, obviously it was time in, in terms of did they have enough time to do that and actually have any impact on it whatsoever. But I don't believe it was, um, you know, helping it along in its journey. Um, but yeah, it kind of adds more fuel onto the fire in regards to George Bush maybe not acting quickly and leaving and making some big decisions rather than anything else. Yeah. Dan, anything? Uh, no, I think that's cool. uh, BS. I think it's just general incompetence and delayed response. Yeah. Okay. 
Insider trading. This is an interesting one. So this theory suggests that certain individuals or entities with prior knowledge of the attacks profited significantly from financial transactions, such as buying put options on airline stocks or insurance policies on the World Trade Center buildings. Um, so there are, yeah, there is a lot of information out there in terms of the buildings recently coming up for renewals on their insurance or having recently been renewed in the days and weeks leading up to 9-11. Um, so what are your thoughts on this one? Financial profit and insider training, trading. You would really just hate the human race if this was done for the people to, in order to profit a bit. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I can't people see People love that. money. They do love money and, you know, the war on terror and all that stuff. You could argue that a lot of that was down for similar reasons, but... Maybe somebody in the comments can clarify this, but I did read somewhere that the Twin Towers were insured the day before for a plane attack. I remember it being very close. Yeah, and I don't know if it was in the Loose Change documentary or a similar one, but perhaps somebody can clarify and see if that was bogus or not. But that was quite uh, interesting. It's one of those, isn't it, where usually they somehow it goes from being insured like five years before to then it's just turned out to be the day before. And it's like, yeah. But that in itself, if you believe that, then that sounds like it's very much an insider thing. Mm -hmm. And it's... Um, but you thought they wouldn't be so obvious about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, few more left. Pod theory. So this theory suggests that the planes involved in the attacks were modified in some way with additional pods or attachments, which may have contained explosives or other equipment used to facilitate the destruction of the towers. Um, I mean, but because all of them were cross-country flights or scheduled to be cross-country flights, they had a lot of jet fuel still within each plane. But this, yeah, this theory suggests that there were, as well as all the additional jet fuel, explosives planted within the planes I, th it's, I just think not many people know the amount of damage a Boeing plane can do if it hits into a building and essentially like we've discussed in terms of the the way the building is made the way it falls it, it, they're going on the, the theory that there's explosives involved whereas if we're thinking that there isn't from the way it falls then I think that kind of answers that within itself and I don't believe that I mean I still find it a a bit disconcerting how they were able to get box cutters and uh, makeshift ships onto planes um, but I don't think they're getting bombs onto the planes well no. yeah I mean you could argue the Boeing is literally a, a bomb anyway with the amount of fuel on board and how big it is yeah it can do more damage than a missile certain missiles Okay, uh, Nostradamus prophecy. So a very small number of individuals interpret the writings of the 16th century French seer Nostradamus as predicting the events of 9-11, pointing to vague and ambiguous passages in his writings as basically evidence of, of prior knowledge to this happening. Um, and again, it's, they are very, in the certain highlighted passages, they are very picky and interpreting quite abstract passages in their own ways to i mean there's no set date obviously um are we ruling nostradamus out yeah i mean it's star signy kind of territory isn't it yeah very much so okay oh, someone's gonna be triggered in the comments there there will be yeah there'll be a big <laughs> yeah big up the uh... luckily my wife doesn't listen to us <laughs> No. Um, okay, so directed energy weapons. This theory suggests that the collapse of the towers was caused by the use of directed energy weapons such as lasers or microwave weapons rather than any kind of conventional explosives or even a controlled demolition uh, or obviously the aircraft collision. So basically it's, it's very... Um, uh, but you can see the fucking plane fly into the fucking towers. Yeah, exactly. It's not CGI. Yeah, it's not Independence Day. Yeah, okay, uh, so remote viewing. Um, so some conspiracy theorists claim that individuals with psychic abilities through a practice known as remote viewings foresaw the 9-11 attacks and attempted to warn authorities about it, but they were ignored or suppressed. And one thing, whenever you kind of Google remote viewings or the psychics that tried to warn of disasters or, or tragic events that occurred, acts of terrorism that occurred, they, they very quickly like point to this photo of tourist guy, which is a photoshopped photo of a man standing on top of one of the towers with a plane approaching uh, it in the background. It's very obviously photoshopped, but that started doing the rounds at the time when it wasn't as um, you know widely known that things could be photoshopped, and many people believe that to have been, you know, someone knowing what was happening behind him, even though obviously it wasn't. But yeah, tourist guy one is a bit of a weird one. Same mm. with remote viewing. 
Have you seen yeah. the... I mean, I don't know what you think about this, Tom, but the Simpsons predicting the future stuff. And yeah, how, yeah, like, yeah. They seem to be nailing... But recently, I don't know if you've seen on Facebook, there's a ton of AI-generated images of the Simpsons. Like, for, for example, that... Um, the ship that collided uh, the bridge in Baltimore. Mm, yeah. And there's suddenly AI generated images of the Simpsons, you know, Lisa and Bart there looking at the boat. And then people in the comments are going, I knew it. The Simpsons <laughs> are just amazing at just predicting this. It's crazy. Well, they never yeah. miss. They never miss. Fucking <laughs> hell. Yeah. Well, that is apparently known as predictive programming. Um, and this theory suggests that the events of 9 11 were foreshadowed or predicted in various in various forms of media, such as movies, television shows, and literature, um, as part of a deliberate effort to psychologically prepare the public for the attacks. And this included The Simpsons, The Matrix. So with The Matrix, Neo's passport expiration date was September the 11th, 2001. Um, Ocean's Eleven, Back to the Future, Fight Club, and Grand Theft Auto. I think there was another movie, but I can't remember exactly the one. Predictive mm. programming, preparing you for things that, yeah, obviously it's happened a lot in The Simpsons prior to AI, but yeah. And one we, we missed there is uh, space weapons and energy fields, but I think we need to go into that because, <laughs> I mean, I don't think any of us believe that to be a thing. Um, but yes, it, yeah. So the attacks would ignite what we now know as the War on Terror, with Bin Laden eventually being killed by US Navy SEALs almost 10 years later on the 2nd of May 2011. Yeah, I mean, even that, there's so many conspiracy theories around because they allegedly dumped his body at sea. So there's conspiracy theories about he's still alive, it, it was a stage, you know, there's, yeah, there's conspir you can throw conspiracies towards anything. But I remember vividly John Cena um, announcing that whilst standing on an announcer's table at WWE. Um, he made quite a speech about it as well, and it goes down very well with the crowd. We have caught and compromised to a permanent end. Osama bin Laden. So many other points, obviously, uh, to this case. It's, there's an endless list of different discussion points on 9-11 um, itself. There's a great website called uh, FEMA Remembers, which really tells the story of each individual victim of the attacks in, in as much detail as they're able to. Um, Fahrenheit 9-11 was another movie, or documentary rather, Michael Moore uh, very quickly made. There are 9-11 icebergs out there, which in terms of details, the darker and deeper you go, the more niche the conspiracies and bits of information get. We also covered the 9-11 revenge killer over on our website, icmap.co.uk, which is the case of Mark Anthony Stroman. So in the weeks and months and even years that followed 9-11, there was a great deal of Islamophobia all across the country. And yeah, Mark Stroman um, committed a spree of murders um, that resulted in him being placed on death row. Um, and he cited his motive as revenge for 9-11. There was the, I'd love to do a Minnesota on this, the 9-11 con lady liar, uh, Tanya Head. And as Tom, Tom mentioned earlier, there were so many people that would later say, I was in the towers, I was here, I was there. This lady span over a period of years the biggest she lost her husband lost she had uh, all sorts of diseases lost relatives um, and was in the one of the top floors of uh, the north tower and everyone believed her she raised so much money for charity and then a community of other survivors or uh, families of loved ones that they'd lost got together and started unpicking her lies and there's a documentary about her uh, on youtube really really interesting so yes, that is the case of the September 11 attacks, but obviously there's so much more out there. There's so many different rabbit holes you can go down, a lot more detail out there you can find, but we hope we've given you, you know, our perspective on, on the case. We'd love to hear what you guys think as well. Um, and yeah, I thought I knew this one would be a fairly heavy one um, with not much, uh, you know, lightness. So um, I actually got sent a couple of things that I wanted to share with you guys. I've, I've given it to produce down already. Um, some musical fans of the podcast sent us a couple little things so uh, uh, Dan if you're able to play play a little track for us um, the Ick Map one please to start off yeah no problem um, what is this yeah just, just a little, little warn me about this a voice so soothing whispers in my ear tales of horror crimes that bring me fear each episode a mystery unfolds, uncovering truth stories left untold. Yeah. I could murder a podcast. 
over a bit more of a country-ish one but it's about rm ben oh no oh no um and here it comes well old ben sat in his rocking chair wishing he had something he picks up the phone but he's too damn scared to call the pizza man down the street (laughs) he's sitting there counting down the minutes his stomach growling, it's a painful sound, but he won't dial that number. He's too timid, scared of the pizza guy coming round. Oh, Bill, why are you so scared of the pizza man delivering Fucking slaps. It's wild well good. You ain't no spring chicken. What? Oh. 34, 38 don't make no difference. 34. 34. 34 wow. and 38 don't make no difference. 34, it means four years make a lot of difference. But that is amazing. Spring chicken pizza, that one's called. Wow. Absolutely that was a, yeah, fantastic. That described a real life hot tub party between the three of us that I was too scared to confront someone for a late order. Dan straight on it. Yeah, pizza. Love yeah. it. Yeah. Full refund, partial refund. That's yeah. so, so that's so cool. So who was that, Tom? It was AI. Yeah. Um, <laughs> AI, just give him a bit of a pointer and they write songs for you now. How that fucking is crazy is that? What a world do we live the in right now? The first one is, both of them are really good. Yeah. But that first one was really good. Amazing. Wow. Oh, I've genuinely thought that was a couple. <laughs> well, what do you know, Tom's done Ben. Come back next time for another Tom Does Ben. <laughs> yes, but I mean, there's lots of fun to be have, had with those, which I'm sure we'll, we'll do and share another oh. one. But I was thinking, oh, maybe we could do, I, next week's case, I might get them to do about because I think it's light enough for me to be able to make them do a song about it. Yeah, yeah amazing. definitely. Well, on that note, it's the final one of the series. Will we get renewed or not for this segment? <laughs> Probably not. Hit it. Benjamin Carter's cryptic clues. Everyone gather around for some cr- clues that can be quite cryptic, but he's going to give them to you anyway. Hope you can figure them out. So... The final cryptic clue for the series. I feel like this is an easy one, but I kind of struggled. Francis Bourgeois is going to be bloody fuming. Francis Bourgeois is going to be bloody fuming. I think that's fine. That's good. I mean, yeah, people don't get that then. People who aren't from the UK might struggle. Yeah, but yeah, I mean, can I can I just say before we wrap up, I just want to echo Tom. Any anything that you think about this case, nine eleven, um, to our lovely viewers and listeners, please please comment below because I'll be loitering around the comment section uh, when this episode goes live, and um, would love to have a discussion with some of you about it all. But not an argument, <laughs> a discussion. <laughs> yeah, we obviously respect everyone's opinions when it comes to this case, and uh, obviously we have condensed this down. I'm sure there's lots of the arguments and evidence that we haven't looked at, which maybe is a real strong indicator in your guys' minds and why you believe a certain thing. But um, yeah, let us know in the comments what, what you guys think. Um, we're not belittling anyone's opinions here. We're just putting forward our own. Absolutely. Nor, yeah, nor are we belittling the events. Obviously, it was an absolute tragedy and our hearts do go out to all those affected by the attacks, which there are m- many thousands of people that were impacted by this and lost loved ones on friends, family. And it's yeah, absolutely heartbreaking. Um, but yeah, we, we hope you um, found the episode interesting. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we look forward to seeing you next week for the big finale. And don't forget, guys, if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to subscribe on wherever you listen to us on or over on YouTube. We'd love to have you on board. But until next time, like we always say, we say this all the time. Keep doing what you're doing. Unless it's kind of green lighting your light intro because I didn't run it by the boys and it sunk a little bit. Just a little, only a little bit. There's lots, lots of stuff happening at the start of the year. Might lose a paragraph of that or something. Because yeah. it's took about three hours long and yeah, so get into it quickly. Mm.
missed the lyric bit. Crazy. <laughs> you missed the best bit, yeah. Scared of the pizza man. See you later. Bye bye. Two bit.